So it is my great pleasure to welcome Andrew Stock. Um, and I've given Andrew, I hope you agree, I've given Andrew a fairly curly question for, to talk about tonight. Um, and, and my reasoning was, Andrew used to be an insider to the energy industry. He's been a, a senior executive in Origin Energy, but now he's spending his efforts as an outsider, but he's got his foot in the door, hasn't he? Because um, Andrew's on the Climate Council, of course, who were all inside the tent until Tony Abbott kicked them out. And now they're funded by us, the general population. And Andrew also sits on our local state Premier's Climate Change Council. And I'm looking forward to hearing whether you've even, who you've met from the Liberal government and what you think of them. So um, please uh, welcome Andrew Stock. Thank you. Well, thanks Heather, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all. Some places in the audience I know, and many of you I don't, but uh, I hope you find what I've got to say interesting. Um, Heather gave me a bit of a boost there, and I'm not sure I'm gonna tell you too many secrets, to be honest, about what happens on the Premier's Climate Change Council, because you'd understand that those things are sort of in camera. Um, but I will take a bit of an opportunity to talk a bit about politics. Not so much state politics, although that's important, but I think federal politics is really important and um, at the juncture we're in right now. So I'm gonna to touch on that. And as I think all of you understand, it's been a pretty fast moving space. Uh, when Heather asked me to do this talk, we were about to head off overseas and um, while we're overseas, we come back, we've got a new prime minister. We seem to have a more uh, right of centre government that we had before I left, uh, judging from comments in the last few days. And as some of you would know, I'm an engineer, not a political scientist, so I don't have a magic wand that you can wave or I can wave and tell you what all the answers are. But I will try and break a few myths down that have been promulgated um, about the energy industry and some of the challenges in energy as we go through the my talk and i think heather i've got about 20 minutes so can you keep a bit of an eye on that maybe no and if i start to run too long you let me know all right okay um i want i won't talk a lot about climate science because i'm not a climate scientist um but you know, I am an engineer uh, by original training and one of the things engineers do is they look at correlations. And when I look at the graph of CO2 emissions uh, or, or particularly CO2 in the atmosphere or CO2 emissions, um, and I look at the graph of global temperatures since about 1800, um, to me it's a pretty close correlation. There is a close relationship between CO2 emissions uh, and temperature. The geologists talk about the Anthropocene, human-influenced climate change, a new geological era. Um, one of the things that a more energy-intense system gives you is more extreme events. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, in a process plant or whether it's in the atmosphere. You get put more energy in, you're going to get more things happening. And that's what we're starting to see in the, in the climate today. We're seeing average global temperatures higher. We're seeing uh, more intense storms. And statisticians um, have done a lot of work together with climate scientists looking at the probability that some of these extreme events that we now see in our weather um, could happen without the influence of uh, global warming, climate change. And the probability of something like that happening is low for any one individual event, but when you add a number of those together, it's extremely low. So, I conclude, that's why I work in the Climate Council, because I think, you know, as someone who's spent their life in the industry, I've got to put something back, uh, not just for Australia, but also for, it's a bit selfish, I mean, we have uh, grandchildren, um, and I think, you know, when I think about the lifespan of my grandmother, who lived to her almost, she lived to a hundredth year. So I think about a hundred years forward, it's not a pretty picture if you had any sort of look at the recent IPCC report that came out yesterday. But 
you wouldn't believe that we had a drought that was going on potentially influenced by those sort of factors. Many of our farmers uh, and certainly some of the politicians that serve them seem to be in denial. I'll pull out quite a few quotes through this talk because I think they're instructive as to either what we're being dished up as a populace or what people genuinely think for our leaders. Here's one quote. I don't think people out here care one way or another. I don't think that climate change is the issue. I don't think that's part of this debate. That's my point. I'm not terribly interested in engaging in those sorts of debate, said our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, when the media asked him about climate change uh, when he was visiting uh, drought farmers out near Quilpie a week or two ago. Craig Kelly, who chairs the LNP Coalition Backbench Energy Environment Committee, said recently, the climate was always dangerous. We didn't make it dangerous. And it's fossil fuels that protect us from that climate. Beggar's belief. In the past 24 hours, as I'm sure most of you would be aware, the IPC has released a report detailing the impacts of uh, what would one and a half degree world look like versus a two degree world. There's some illustrative pathways in there as to what needs to be done to keep carbon budgets globally at a level that would keep that temperature rise at one and a half degrees. And relative to 2010, there's a very interesting little table uh, in the summary that looks like this. Sorry, I won't see it online, but it looks like that. It's very interesting because when you look at it relative to 2010, what it says is that the use of coal must fall 60% to 80% by 2030 and 75 to 100% sorry, 95% by 2050. And gas use must fall 20 to 35% by 2030 and 50 to 75% by 2050. I mean, these are, um, when you look at the sort of world we live in, these are humongous challenges. No one would deny the scale of the challenge. So what's the response of our national leaders be? You know, it's interesting, Morrison set the tone yesterday with, that uh, venerated um, Sydney shock jock, Mr. Alan Jones, and he said, we're not held to any of them, that's the IPCC report conclusions, nor are we bound to go and tip money into that big climate fund. I'm not gonna spend money on global climate conferences and all that nonsense. The uh, former energy environment minister Frydenberg said, if we take coal out of our energy system, the lights will go out on the east coast of Australia. It's as simple as that. Well, of course, if you took coal out today, yes, the lights would go out if you didn't do anything about replacing it. That's the message. And Environment Minister Price admitted this morning on AM that she hadn't read the whole report, but she assured us that coal does form a very important part of the Australian energy mix. And every year, every year there's new technology with respect to coal and what its contribution is to emissions. To say that it's got to be phased out by 2050 is drawing a very long bow. Well, as someone who's followed the coal industry and its efforts to sequester CO2 for at least the last 20 years of my working life, I think it's drawing a very long bow to say that the coal industry will be much further advanced by 2050 than it's advanced itself in the last two decades in terms of economically sequestering CO2. And uh, comments by the Deputy PM, McCormack, weren't much better. Australians emissions, Australia's emissions are on the rise. Might have missed it because generally when a government, federal government issues emissions reports, they put them out at a time when it gets virtually no media. If anyone watched Media Watch last night, you would have actually seen it got some media on Media Watch, but I'm not sure how much of the general population watch media watch on ABC. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, anyway, the Prime Minister doesn't think that our emissions are a problem. He says we'll meet our 2030 emission reduction targets in a canter. That's uh, after he was pushed by Barrett Cassidy on Insiders. I guess the reality is I think that we won't reach our 2030 commitments 
which are way short of what's needed to hold global warming on a proportionate basis uh, for our share, uh, less than one and a half or two degrees. I mean, our commitments currently, the 26 to 28 percent you hear about, that's about uh, three or four degrees of warming, not one and a half to two. Um, to be consistent with one and a half to two, the sort of numbers in terms of emissions reduction that are talked to need to happen in Australia, as was advised to the Abbott government by the Climate Change Authority when it was independent, uh, was of the order of 45 to 60% reduction by 2030. So what we, what we, what Abbott pitched to um, Paris was about half of what was required to get to hold our respective country share at the sort of level it should have been. Well, what are the facts about emissions? The latest data shows that our national emissions have risen consistently year on year for the last three years. And they've been rising ever since the LNP repealed the carbon price and dramatically cut the rent. That's the renewable energy target. Without major policy changes, I believe that the government's own analyses show, um, and they haven't issued one since about December last year, but the latest one that they had issued made it very clear that we would miss our 2030 target and we'd miss it by a wide margin. The latest data released by the government, and actually came out um, Friday a week ago, which happened to be the day that the Banking Royal Commission interim findings were released, uh, and <clears throat> we had two grand finals on that weekend. So although it wasn't a, you know, a media blackout, it was essentially a media blackout. Um, what it actually showed when you look at those numbers and you take out the land use change component of it, is that it's the rest of Australia's emissions are the highest now they have ever been. Yeah, yeah, we are now emitting more CO2 across the rest of our economy, apart from the land use fudge, than we have ever emitted. And for the last three years, it's been going up. 1.7% uh, in the year to December 2017. And since 1990, emissions in electricity have gone up over 40% and transport emissions have gone up over 60%. Um, really, land use change is the only thing that uh, is counting in our favour. So when we talk about meeting Kyoto 1 and Kyoto 2 targets by 2020, say, it's really the land use change thing that allows us to get it there. If you took that out of the equation, our emissions are way higher way higher than they were in 1990. But don't let facts get in the road of spin. What did Morrison's response say? He said, we're on track to hit it, and we will hit it. I have no doubt about the fact we're going to meet our targets out to 2030. We've got commitments, we've got our policies in place, they're working. Well, I think the numbers show that they're not working. Angus Taylor sings from the same song sheet. He's the energy minister. Emission reductions are the least of our problems. With every prospect, we'll reach the 26% below 2005 levels ahead of schedule and without interventions. We're going to reach the 26% reduction anyway, so we don't need to worry about it. Put it to the side. As is comments from the new Environment Minister, Melissa Price. We'll meet the responsible 2030 target. We're currently at the lowest level on a per capita and GDP basis that we were in 28 years. Well, the per capita arguments trotted out are a good example, another good example of how statistics are spun to misrepresent the truth. The per capita emissions measure was put out or promoted several, sorry, don't worry about that, several years ago. And one of the lead promoters of it was the chap who's now I think it's the president of the Business Council of Australia, used to be my boss when he was CEO of Origin. And he was promoting this idea of a per capita emissions measure at the time that the company was gearing up to um, produce a lot of LNG from coal seam gas in Queensland. And also at the time when the whole rep debate was happening and uh, that gentleman was quite forthright in seeking to either get rid of the rep or certainly cut it substantially in very public argument and debate. So 
far from being low on a per capita basis that the sort of spin that you get from Morrison, Price, Frydenberg would have you believe, our per capita emissions are actually the highest of any developed economy in the world. Now, there are a few economies out there that have got a slightly higher per capita emissions than us. A couple of countries in the Emirates uh, and one or two others, Luxembourg, not a lot of people. Ours are the highest when you take those two or three out. It's worse than that though. They say we're getting much better. Well, when you look at the data back to 20, 1990, our energy emissions per capita, sorry, our emissions per capita, so that includes agriculture and everything, have actually barely moved in almost three decades, which is a dramatic contrast to what's happened um, in the US, Germany and the UK, for example, US, they've cut their per capita emissions 20% in that time frame. Germany, 30%. The UK, 40%. So why don't we hear Morrison talk about that? Or Price, or Frydenberg, or Taylor. You know, we hear about the Productivity Commission. Well, maybe the Productivity Commission should take a look at how productive we are in this country in terms of using energy and reducing the emissions that go with it. The reality is our emissions have been going up for the last three years and they've been doing that ever since the current government removed carbon pricing, drastically cut the rep and created a two to three year investment freeze in renewables in the process of trying to undermine the rep. And I know that because I was on the CFC board at the time and the only projects that were happening in Australia on large scale for a couple of years were projects that were being uh, catalyzed with funding from the CEFC. Nothing else was happening. I say CFC, there's one other thing that was going on at that time, was that the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, had a program to effectively take their electricity purchase 100% renewable for the ACT and its consumers, and that was together with the CFC, the only thing that's driving any renew large scale renewable projects over about a two to three period. And when you listen to the current dialogue from Minister, um, the Energy Minister, it's pretty clear to me that he's about trying to create that same sort of insert uncertainty again. And he talks about solar, talks about wind. Um, he's got a track record when it comes to wind. Um, so, Another argument you'll hear often, um, and some of you in the audience have heard me address this before, is that Australia only accounts for a small percentage of the world's emissions, so it doesn't matter. What, what does it matter what we do? Well, if you include the emissions that go with the products that we produce and sell overseas, we're actually the sixth, we, and you attribute them back to us, and that's a debate you can have, but if you were to do that, we would be the sixth largest emitter of emissions globally after Japan, China, um, and, and the other large emitters. So it does matter what we do. And the other thing, other reason why it matters is that in this nation, along with uh, many other nations, we account collectively for about just under 50% of the world's emissions. So if, we, if it's okay for us to say, well, what does it matter? We're only one, one and a half percent. Why isn't it okay for the other 49, 50 other countries that collectively add up to about 45% of global emissions to say, well, it doesn't matter what we do either. And where does that end up? Not a very satisfying argument. Another argument you have heard often is that, and this has particularly happened in the last year when there was a lot of activity to try and get the national energy guarantee uh, over the line. It fell at the last hurdle because the prime minister got the flick, but, one of the things you heard often was that the nation hasn't had an energy policy for over a decade, which is patently wrong. We've had one energy policy which lasted the distance, and that's for the large-scale renewable energy target. It was introduced by the Howard government back at the, pretty much the start of last decade, and it's run and been added to um, under Rudd-Gillard and then undermined by Abbott, but it's stood the test. 
And that's driven something of the order. I did a back of the envelope, somewhere between 20 and $30 billion of investment. When you look at the capacity that's been added and thousands of jobs, the current in tw late 2017, the number of people actively working on large scale renewable projects was about somewhere between seven, and 8,000 direct jobs associated with it. It's also meant that the electricity sector is about the only sector where emissions are falling. And I think it would have been a lot more effective a lot sooner in terms not only of reducing emissions, but maybe we wouldn't have had quite the price shocks we've had in South Australia after Northern shutdown, Victoria with Hazelwood shutting. We would actually brought forward some of that capacity, that new capacity before the old stuff shut. Because if you bring capacity forward in a market, the risk of a price shock when you take a piece of capacity out, such as has happened, is much less. But by effectively creating a two to three year hiatus, it has put more pressure on two things. One is wholesale electricity prices. <clears throat> and secondly, the price of green certificates that go with the renewable energy target. Uh, because there's been a shortage relative to of supply relative to uh, what retailers are required to equip. And obviously in a market where you're short on supply pushes up price. There's another fiddle that goes on with that as well. Um, and that is that all of the big retailers don't pay the price for renewable certificates that you and I get charged. And the reason is that most if not all of the deals that they do are not transparent. They're what's called over-the-counter deals. They're bilateral. You know, they, they run a tender or they write a contract with a developer. You might sort of get some sense of what that price might be in the media, but you won't get it down to the dollar. And that's one of the problems and one of the reasons that the Climate Council stood up against the NEG was that we wanted to see uh, an emissions registry that was transparent because consumers ultimately pay the price for the emission savings. Why shouldn't they know what that price is rather than trust your electricity retailer? Energy is needed 24 seven in a modern economy. We hear that. How many times do we hear that? The reality is that modern renewables coupled with storage, can power a modern economy that requires fast, flexible, reliable power. You can't get reliable power out of a coal-fired power station, particularly the aging ones we have now. In the last six months, there's been 70 different failures of fossil fueled power stations. And every time you take a power station out, 600, 800 megawatts drops off the system in an instant. That's not good for reliability. And you don't help emissions by coupling up pumped hydro, such as Snowy 2.0, with some of the older coal fleet in New South Wales, because what you do with the round trip losses on pumped hydro is you convert that effectively into something that's worse in emissions than your lawn, which is now the worst emitter on the wet uh, and then. We also hear that renewables are expensive. I think most of you would know they're not. Uh, wholesale renewables um, are not expensive. They're actually the lowest cost way of bringing forward new power station investments, which is why, and it's not just me saying that, although in the last few months I was on the CFC board, we saw the tendered prices for large scale solar projects come down about 30% in six months. That's continued. But now we see the large retailers, the gen tailors, like the likes of Origin, stating on the public record that they don't see a future for coal. You know, renewables is the future, coupled with storage. I mean, it beggars belief that our Prime Minister is on the record by saying, uh, by having said, by all means, have the world's biggest battery, have the world's biggest banana, have the world's biggest prawn like we have on the roadside around the country, but that is not solving the problem. And Canavan, the resources minister, said it's the Kim Kardashian of the energy world. It's famous for being famous, but it doesn't do very much. Well, 
it actually does do a hell of a lot. It does what it's supposed to do, which is primarily stabilize the frequency in the reliability in the power grid when the power grid is uh, exposed to significant upsets. And it does it faster than any fossil fuel power station can do uh, by a country mile. And there's a report on the web that AEMO did going back a few months ago. And it's, you know, there's one graph in, or two graphs in there and you go and look at that and it's chalk and cheese. I mean, the old thermal stations wandering all over the shop and the Tesla battery is drawing straight lines. And nothing could be clearer than that. And I don't know, I wasn't here at the time, I was overseas, but when the two interconnectors from Queensland and New South Wales dropped out when we were away, um, and South Australia and Queensland Islanded, and Victoria and New South Wales had to support themselves, they tripped off pot lines in New South Wales and Victoria on their smelters. Uh, several hundred thousand people lost power. And by the way, what happened here? We rode it through without an upset, is what I understand, and so did Queensland. And one of the reasons we rode it through was because that battery responded in milliseconds. I mean, I could go on. People say the neg is better than nothing. Well, actually, it's not better than nothing. That's a myth. I mean, I think it reflects the sorry state that our energy and emissions debate has got to in this country that we accept failure or near failure as better than nothing. What happened ever to aspiration and meeting a challenge? It seems that um, our energy and emissions debate has become so dysfunctional in this country that, that we accept policy on the basis that it's better than nothing. Well, actually nothing, as several different models showed, is better than what the NEG would have delivered. I mean, people say that renewables cost jobs. I've just indicated to you earlier how much investment and how much in the way of jobs have been brought forward. Renewables are blamed in South Australia for high power prices. It's a fallacy. We've had high power prices in South Australia ever since the national electricity market started. You can go back two decades ago and you can see reports that state the primary two reasons why electricity prices are higher in the state. Originally were a lack of competition, particularly in the retail market, but also in the generation market, the wholesale market. And secondly, um, the long skinny nature of the grid. As Monica well knows, uh, since the NEM started, uh, electricity, um, electric air conditioners, reverse cycle air conditioner penetration went through the roof. They make the low curve much more peaky. That reinforces the position of the gas generators in being able to control the price. So, uh, and also since then, gas has got a lot more expensive. So A, that can control the price. B, it's more expensive. Um, C, we don't have much competition. So lay down the there for making money and we have a long skinny grid. So all of those things mean we've got high power prices. Power prices are actually starting to come down in this country now and we hear our um, politicians saying, well, that means that you know, our policies are working. It's rubbish. The reason power prices are coming down is because there's more capacity coming into the system relative to demand. What is that capacity? Well, people aren't building new coal powered stations. It's the renewable capacity that's coming in that's driving the price down. Final thing I wanted to touch on is the magic wand. Um, and so let me just spend a couple of minutes with, with a bit of license to do that. Um, the whole process of setting energy policy in this country is a bit of a merry-go-round. I worked in the industry for all of my working life pretty well. And what has got worse in the last few years is the round robin for a certain small cadre of people that move between ministers' offices to industry associations to another industry association, maybe back into the federal bureaucracy in energy or environment, possibly a treasury, then back into another industry association, then maybe to a minister's advisor. It's just a merry-go-round. And what you find is that particular groups are very influential in that merry-go-round of people. Um, the Minerals Council of Australia, 
the Business Council of Australia, the Deputy Chair of the Energy Security Board came out of the Business Council, and so it goes. But it's worse now than I can remember it being throughout my career, to be honest. I think the other thing that surprisingly hasn't got any better, notwithstanding the climate change news that's been going on, is that we seem to have a core leadership group that are climate skeptics. I don't necessarily own up to it, but I thought the best way to evidence that was to use some quotes from John Roskam. John's the executive director of the Institute of Public Affairs, which uh, you know has, has uh, fostered several of our younger political leaders and aspiring political players. What did he say about our Liberal and National Party politicians and where they sit on climate change? He said, more than 50% are solid skeptics and more than 50% feel they need to be seen to be doing something but the science is not settled. In other words, because they're politicians, they've got to look like they're acting because that's what people who vote for them want to do. But he said over 50% of the libs are climate skeptics. And he said of the nationals, 90% are probably skeptics too. And that was in 2017. So that's the current lot we're dealing with, except for the one that's gone. In Australia, as I said, there's no magic wand here. In Australia, we get what we vote for. So the fundamental question is that if the current political masters are in the majority climate skeptics, or at least half of them are, and they seem to be the ones that are more influential, um, at least in terms of who's the prime minister and so forth, um, they're boosted by big dollars from donors with vested interest in fossil fuel, mining and media companies, and industry associations like the BCA, the Minerals Council and others are out there deliberately peddling misinformation both into the politicians and to the public. I believe it's time for some fresh air in Canberra instead of the coal and gas fueled pall that hangs over the place. The next federal election, I think, is an opportunity for Australians to demonstrate, and I don't know what the answer is, but I think it will be an opportunity for Australians to demonstrate whether they care more about their wallets and what's in it tomorrow, or whether they care more about the future of the planet that they're going to bequeath to their children and their grandchildren. And I guess at the end of the day, what we'll get will be the energy and climate change policies that we elect. And that's the question. What do we want? Um, I'm not here to tell you what you all should have. That's your choice. But one of the things we can do is be more active, I think. Talk to our politicians, particularly if you know someone in New South Wales, Victoria or uh, Queensland, have discussions with them because that's probably where the game will um, be resolved, not so much in South Australia. We're a bit small these days. And with that, I'll, I don't have, a, as I said, a magic wand, but there's a few thoughts um, about what it's been like and what it is like. Thank you. Now, we are not going to let Andrew Colbert say. He's got to share it now with our chair and deputy chair, Margaret and Bryony. Sorry, Bryony, I thought I'd kept you in the loop on this. <laughs> and then there's a third chair, so, so sit yourselves down. Um, and we're going to, and this can be a conversation because Andrew clearly hasn't answered the question. And it'd be great to have ideas from the floor. Um, and I will adjust that. There we go. Look at that. And you can you keep it closed up? Yeah. Um, Brian. Yep. So um, I'm going to start with Margaret because Margaret's been cooking some questions. Oh, I've got more now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ronnie, I hope you I forgot to make sure you prep for that thing up <laughs> there. So there's a whole audience here and you might have questions and you might have um, ideas. You know, the question hanging over us all is how do we change the, the politics of climate and energy? So, Margaret. I'm good. <laughs> you said you were going to focus on federal and you did. Yeah. At almost well, the last thing you said was that South Australia can't do much, but you also said that one of the two, well, two of the things we need to do is greatly reduce coal use and gas use, and states and territories have control over whether they approve new coal extraction, new gas extraction, new fossil fuel yep. infrastructure. South Australia has a proud reputation of being a pioneer, and I'd like to think that we could somehow convince the South Australian government, despite being liberal, <laughs> to take a common sense approach and ban new fossil fuel extraction and infrastructure. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? Possible? How do we get it to happen? Well, the reason I, well, let me just, I don't think South, by stating, when I stated that I thought South Australia had less influence, it was in the context of the federal election. Ah, true. I, I think South Australia has had a fantastic influence globally when it comes to demonstrating what can be done when you set your mind to it. Um, I mean, there are very few places in the world where the electricity system has transformed in a way that it's gone in this state, frankly. And, <clears throat> and you all know the, you know the details of that. But... Um, we are uh, a case study, you know, uh, sometimes when you're at the leading edge, it's the bleeding edge. You know, you learn by doing. And there's no doubt that we've done that in this state. Um, in terms of fossil fuel, I mean, we still use quite a bit of gas. Yes. Um, but notwithstanding that, our emissions in this state have come off from memory. Uh, I can't remember statewide. I think it's maybe 20% or more. But in electricity, it's off maybe 40, 45% in a decade or so. I mean, there is nowhere else in the country that's done anything like that. So I think both at a state level, nationally, when it comes to emissions and what can be done and showing what can be done, uh, and globally. I mean, globally, there are there is nowhere else in the world that has made it the sort of trans transition that we are doing. Mm. And I think actually, I mean, I, I was very conscious in not saying anything negative about the South Australian LNP government because I think, you know, uh, our energy minister has, uh, at least in the, you know, a couple of discussions I've had with him um, about these sort of issues, seemed to me to be a pretty pragmatic sort of bloke. He gets that renewables are good for his electorate. I mean... They get that. He gets that. Um, I think they actually understand the benefit that a widely distributed storage systems across households will, will bring by way of benefit too, particularly if it's coordinated. So I think there's a lot of good things happening. Um, and what we've got to do, partly I think as South Australians, is counter the, the garbage that comes out of um, the Murdoch press, and we don't have much choice as to what we can read in South Australia, unfortunately. It's all Murdoch press, uh, if you buy a paper. Um, we, we've got to counter that. And when people like uh, the commentators get on the radio in the mornings and there's an opportunity for someone to ring up from the public, mm. one of us sort of take that opportunity and ring up as a housewife or a house husband or whatever, um, because it's the common person putting a point of view that will have more influence on a shock job than an industry insider or outsider like me. Um, so I think that's really important. As to fossil fuel extraction, um, uh, I guess I, I think that's important um, because, you know, um, I, work my industry, I work my life in the gas industry and energy and, and uh, there was a time when gas was seen as a transition fuel. Mm. I think, you know, if you look at the climate science and the concept of a carbon budget for the globe, when we're now at a point where, as the IPCC stuff indicates, that we really, um, two things have happened. One is we can't keep burning fossil fuels. 
So maybe if we burnt more gas, but we should be cutting back on other fossil fuels like coal dramatically if you're going to make room for the gas within the context of a fixed budget. Um, but the other thing is that um, uh, renewable technologies have got cheaper, gas has got more expensive domestically, um, and renewables plus storage are now probably faster and more responsive than gas has been and ever could be. So I think there's a whole range of reasons why, uh, yes, industry needs gas still, um, but I think we should continue to decarbonise our electricity system just as fast as we can. Now, does that mean no more um, fossil fuel extraction? Um, certainly we need to be moving away from that and certainly not approving new coal mines in New South Wales or Queensland. I, I just think that's... I, I, I can't get my head around the mentality of people that think that that's okay. I, I mean, part of the thinking that it is in South Australia we don't really have any more coal to extract, so that little bit, that bit of it's easy. And in terms of gas supply, the AMO predicts that by 2025, South Australia will be um, zero net. Uh, sorry, zero. Uh, sorry, net. Um, what is it? Net 100% renewables, right? That's yeah. the exp expression. Sorry about that. Um, with still gas being important as a backup fuel, but yeah. ever diminishing amounts yeah. required. And the previous government, when they um, gave subsidies for new gas extraction in the southeast and Cooper Basin, a condition of that was that South Australia got first call on that gas if we need it. So we don't have a risk of supply if the South Australian government were to ban new coal and gas extraction. Uh, it would have no impact on <coughs> in terms of keeping the lights on. Mm. It may not have an impact. You think it would? Um, look, I, I mean, I think there are... There's an old saying, there's many ways to skin the cat. And I think so long as gas on the eastern seaboard is linked to LNG export prices, which in turn are linked to world prices globally, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're denominated in US dollars. So you probably noticed recently the cost of uh, uh, petrol at the, at the service station's gone up quite a bit. You know, it was about, it's gone up 20 cents a litre roughly in about six weeks, roughly. The reason it's gone up is the oil prices have gone up a bit and the exchange rate with the US dollar has gone down. Now, now on the eastern seaboard, our gas, is priced relative to oil, because that's how LNG is priced. Um, and it's priced in US dollars. So if the Australian dollar tanks, maybe goes down to 50 or 60 cents, you know, the price of domestic gas is gonna go through the roof. If oil goes to $100 and the Australian dollar tanks, gas will be 15 or $20 a gigajoule. I mean, you won't be running gas power stations very much at that price um, because, and people will be rushing to build more solar and more storage because they will cut thermal fuels to ribbons economically. Mm -hmm. And that's what will happen in Queensland, I think, in time too with coal, is it'll get cut to ribbons because like South Australia, Queensland is extremely well endowed with, you know, particularly solar, but also wind. And once they worked out that they can do these things, um, I don't think there's any turning it around. Just government policy could help it make it all happen a lot more effectively than necessarily has happened here. Sure. I'll play it more. So, in, in terms of uh, government policy, um, as often said, because uh, renewables are now on the par with the other.
I mean, I think up until fairly recently, that wasn't the case. I mean, it's really only been, I think it's really only been in the last 12 to 18 months that large scale solar and wind have got down to the mid, mid 50s, 60s. So one of the things that we do need is an emissions policy in the country. Because if we had a, whether it's the sort of thing that Obama designed where every state had its own pathways, um, uh, or whether it's something different. <clears throat> but we need something to, to provide an incentive for people to invest in new capacity um, before the old stuff falls over. And we need, and that doesn't necessarily, I don't think, have to be something that is like a subsidy for renewables. What it's got to be, though, is something that recognises we've got an emissions challenge, not just in electricity, by the way. You mentioned transport and you know, transport is probably a bigger challenge for our economy than electricity, actually. Um, but, you know, if you had a, whether it's an emissions price or whether it's regulations that set, you know, elements of the NEG were trying to do that, the National Energy Guarantee were trying to do that, but it was all behind closed doors. I mean, my problem with the NEG was it was all non-transparent to the people that are paying for it, us. So no problem with the design, but have A, the target more aspirational, and B, make it transparent. Um, that drives an efficient market. And I'm sure if that was the case, we'd see a lot of people investing in new capacity. Um, the other thing that needs to happen as well is that, um, you know, this theory that just let the market rip and it'll all be fine, in my view, is rubbish. You know, I'm well and truly on the record when we had the blackout in South Australia, one of the reasons we had that blackout is that it was the system was being run like flat out in the face of a very large storm coming. Well, Blind Freddy doesn't do that. You know, you, you make safe. That didn't happen because the market was being run for the dollar. AEMO has since worked out that's not what they ought to be doing as a responsible market operator. And so there's been a lot more work done around that. And so there needs to be some guidance around what the emissions targets are, but also what the reliability targets are. The reliability side of it, there's a lot of work going on in that area. Um, and I'm quite confident that the industry will ensure that it delivers a reliable system going forward. But we need an investment signal that's built around emissions. Sorry to go on. So we've got a couple so of questions coming up. I'm not in line with All right. Yes, you. Another area that's taken over has been rooftop generation. And I don't believe that is designed and compatible with the national energy market system, but it's taken off and is it becomes is increasingly an important part of our energy market that they need integration. Mm. And particularly, uh, are they going to be have and have not in terms of those who can have solar on their roofs, etc., versus those who who don't sort of thing. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, I, I think I would tend to agree that with a lot of the comments you've made, Ian, um, and, and I'm sure Karina would know better than me in many aspects of uh, making solar available um, to certain groups that it's hard normally to access. Um, I think there needs to be more thought given to how to make that work. There are people, uh, you know, here and in other states, trying to find ways through that, particularly for tenanted properties. Yeah. Um, I mean, not so much in Adelaide, although it's starting to happen, but you know, you go to Melbourne or Sydney or Queensland, there's a lot of high rise apartments. And currently there's not, an, <clears throat> not a cost effective way of wheeling solar power from say someone next door or a paddock or whatever through the system, you know, to a set of tenants. Of, uh, or owners of, of apartments. Um, so the systems need to get better. The other thing that 
and I think this is where South Australian government is doing, you know, is continuing to set a positive lead forward is in relation to household storage. Um, and I think that's quite transformative. Um, if the cost of household storage drops a few thousand dollars more, um, and I think it will, um, but it might take a bit longer given our exchange rate um, and given that the uptake in electric cars is absorbing a lot of battery capacity. But, you know, I think within five years, we'll see the price of household storage significantly less. And what we saw with solar was that you get down to sort of five to seven thousand dollars to put several kilowatts on your roof. You know, it just walks out the door. And then what you've got to do is manage it. And the reason I think storage is really important, and I put a system on our house, uh, we've got a townhouse, but I put storage together with more solder on it um, uh, December last year, is it transforms the way that you use energy in the house. You think about it a bit more, but you don't actually draw off the grid very much. You still stay connected to the grid. And I think if you could collectively join, you know, 40 or 50,000 household storage systems together, the so-called duck curve in the middle of the day that we hear about with solar, you know, pushing too much power into the grid goes away, frankly, because it's all a lot of it's going into battery storage. Now, the batteries could fill up on a really sunny day by 8 or 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, still be exporting, so that needs to be managed. But there's a lot more flexibility around how you can manage things. And the internet continues to outsmart us all, I think, in the speed at which it goes. So you put all that together, I think there's tremendous opportunity rather than tremendous problem. And if I can and if just I can comment on that, I've just come back from the UK, UK and, and, and they're all, all talking, talking about flexibility. And you go, you, go, you haven't got your solar penetration. penetration. We've got, they're they're panicked about panic electric about vehicles. vehicles. So it's not, so not five houses five, in a row with solar. It's going to assist their grid in five houses in a row with an electric vehicle trying to charge at the same time. So they're desperate to get the balance Right, and in fact, that you that pretty much answered the answer question that Gregory asked, asked which was also which about $5,000 um, national, national household rent to put in solar and, and, and to put it towards the farm for their renters. Their renters. Their renters. Their renters. The rental yeah. problem, problem is trying to be solved by solar gardens, solar gardens um, um, uh, uh, particularly uh, interstate. Um, um, but but it's storage is definitely separate part of that story. Of that story. So, Graham, is that next uh, uh, question? Can I just say something oh, yes, else sorry. to answer oh, the other part of the house, sorry. the house and the have not part of your hmm. comment, um, please? Um, Corinne is actually just starting outreach to local councils, uh, initially in South Australia, but in other states as well, um, with a, a model which is basically the same as the quick win model we use for um, giving interest-free loans to non-profit organisations. The aim of this would be that as a, specifically as a climate action on behalf of the local council, or on behalf of everyone in their area really, but specifically as a climate focused action rather than a dollar saving action, a council could have um, borrow at low interest a lot of money and make interest-free loans available to everyone who in the, their area with the aim of having solar on the roof of everyone in our local council area, right? And we, um, we've done all the sums. In, with a five year payback, um, everyone could end up with essentially a free solar system because the savings on their bills would be paying for the solar and council would, it would be a revolving fund. Council would be getting the money coming back in from the loan repayments, just the same as with the, with the Carina model. And once everyone in their area has got solar, then council can do something else with that pool of money or give it back to the bank that they borrowed it from or whatever. Um, and it occurs to me that even a state, well, state governments are starting to do that in a way. South Australia is starting to offer mm. interest-free loans. And since South Australia started We're talking about the policy, Victoria and Queensland yeah, have as well, which right. is another example of South Australia being a, mm -hmm. a bit of a pioneer. Sorry. Just a few more questions. I'm going to do speedier answers, please. <laughs> right. Look, clearly there's a government that just, you cannot show, that they can't even identify the problem. It is a beggar for me to come to the issue. 
And I was writing an article and I referred to the Flat Earth Society. And I went in and looked at the Flat Earth Society website. And they've gone to great lengths to try and explain themselves. And I thought, if we can understand the Flat Earth Society, we're actually going to start understanding the psychology of this current government. Because they're not, un they're not just not identifying the problem. They're not even wanting to know the problem. Don't confuse me with facts. My mind is made up. Your part of thinking. How do you get around that? when you have a mindset. That, that is the challenge. And I think maybe it's humor, maybe it's other angles to tie it. Yeah, Kevin, you mean, you know, we tie the technical approach. But you know what it's like. It's just sorry. doesn't work. So, break through. Any answer? <laughs> it's worth reading the Flat Earth Society to understand. Well, as I said, I think we all vote. Yes, vote. Yeah. And I listened to Mark Butler this morning, frankly, and I didn't put his quotes in my address because they're all completely rational and uh, <laughs> sensible with all due respect. No, I mean, it's chalk and cheese. So if you heard Mark, or if you haven't heard him, listen to his interview that was with Fran Kelly this morning on Radio National. I mean, the contrast between his narrative uh, and frankly, the rubbish that I, which were the quotations, they're not rubbish, they were real quotations that I read out when I was addressing you. I mean, it's just chalk and cheese. Brian? Yeah, I guess just to supplement that question a bit, um, I'm curious, particularly perhaps through your work with the Climate Council, to know um, there, there are a number of approaches we can take to contribute to making progress. We can install solar or batteries, um, we can lobby, we can be, you know, take an activist approach. Mm. From, those, from, I guess, that work and, and other parts of the work that you do, um, where would you say is perhaps, on one hand, the most effective um, way to gain ground or to make traction? And, and conversely, where do you think we're most lacking? If, if we're all just looking for one thing we could do, where would you say invest your efforts? Oh. <laughs> Magic wand. Um, look, I think the Climate Council does this. what it aims to do is to provide information. And I think the thesis there is that if you provide people with factual information, you bust the myths that get trotted out, um, and you do it in a way that um, communicates effectively uh, through media or through written reports or whatever mechanism it is, um, and you start to build collaborative alliances with people that are impacted, whether it's you know firefighters or whether it's farmers, uh, whether it's local councils, local governments, and that's the sort of thing that the Climate Council is doing, is there are a lot of people in our society that we see that are actually quite worried about this. And they're worried that they want to do something, they want to be better informed, and they want to be to see change. And I think one of the theses that the Climate Council is built on is we provide information, you provide linkages, you get people that are impacted doing the talking rather than so-called experts. Mm. Um, you know, it's a lot more effective. Mm. Um, and if you have that happening, I mean, just look at what's happened in the last 24 hours. I mean, it's a, it's a silly analogy, but I mean, for God's sake, using the Sydney Opera House <laughs> to, to advertise a horse race and then to, la to lord or glorify by your presence uh, the chap that took, you know, the um, CEO to pieces on, li uh, on live radio. You know, I, I heard this evening that something like 270,000 people in 24 hours signed up on a petition. I mean, that gets attention. I don't think Alan Jones apologises too often, but he did this morning. So if things like that can move a float like that, then I think you get collaborative behaviour of people, whether it's through their vote or whether it's through ringing up their local member. Um, you know, it changes what politicians do because at the end of the day, they're out of a job. They're out of a job if they don't get back. So I'm, so I'm not sure that's a good answer, but I reckon that's, we live in a democratic society and I think that's a good thing and let's leverage it. I'm gonna hand the lucky last question over here. I'll just two comments and then 
question. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, um, I wonder if the town hall kind of setting like this is a way to kind of uh, take the answer to Um A couple of weeks ago, there was uh, big ideas had an IQ uh, on, uh, debate about uh, if it was the right time to, to go here and initiative. Yeah. So, um, 60% of the doing walk in, and they were convinced the end of the 78% were uh, convinced by the end of the So, just by having four like this, two boards, two against, two dialogue, it's really interesting. Um, I get a bit more demoralised when uh, a person basically gets more time for a rebuttal than the United States and the PCC report does. Within 10 hours, you're getting absolute soundbite. From um, the government, uh, they don't, uh, they clearly are not better. And uh, like I said, and the uh, other council, the council, the process, and um, free term, uh, I guess, use. Yeah. Uh, so, a question I'm just wondering about the uh, interconnect to the New South Wales. Who did that research? Who was down to the Um Well, just quickly, um, and I, I must admit, I haven't read the um, What's called the RIT T study that or that's been done on the economics, but it's no, that's one of the reasons I haven't read it. And, <laughs> uh, I find I go to sleep. Um, so I think interconnected would be good. I mean, if you build yourself, if you if South Australia's thesis is it wants to be a powerhouse of renewables, and if the thesis is renewable power is going to drive lower pricing for electricity, and I think it will, um, and you want to have a system that's robust. Well, you need to have more interconnectivity, I think. And it gives us a capacity, to, if we had two or effectively three lines out of the state, to export more. We will very soon, if not already, have hit a capacity limit as to how much more we can shove into the system by way of renewables um, without curtailing it quite a bit of the time, winding it back, because we can't export it all. Well, I'm not saying we're quite at that point yet, but. AEMO uh, will run certain gas stations, so we've got to, they've got to have room, and they do that for stability reasons. Um, so they're producing some electricity. We're running flat out on wind, so uh, AEMO will start to curtail things like wind and solar if they're both cranking at the same time because we can't export. Our exports are limited to, I don't know, 500 megawatts into Victoria, maybe 100 through Riverlink. I'm oh, sorry, um, the DC link. So... I think an interconnector is good. Who's going to pay for it? Um, good question. Ultimately, consumers pay in this system. That's the way it works. Um, you know, there are people that are out there that will fund it. Uh, the CEFC previously at least would have looked at providing significant funding. Um, it's possible that you could probably build it if governments were of New South Wales and Victorian persuasions, doesn't matter what politics, but if governments were to effectively write a a haulage agreement, um, you don't need to have it satisfy a RIT-T test and have a regulated asset. If someone's still got to pay for it, and we will pay part of it, but so should New South Wales. <clears throat> if there's one state in Australia that's, in my view, most exposed to the changes going on in the electricity industry, it's New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And they've got their head well and truly planted in the sand. Um, they are most at risk of seeing outages, so it's in New South Wales' interest, and certainly Transgrid would more, be more than happy to, to fund part of it, and I'm sure to push it back to the New South Wales um, consumers to help pay for it. But I think it would be in the national interest. Um, there is some arguments that say, well, we shouldn't be investing in more interconnection because why don't we have more local generation and, and local use? And there is that argument as well. I mean it may be overtaken by technologies, but I think that's still a way off. And if we believe that we're the powerhouse for renewables for the nation, on the mainland at least, uh, we need more export markets. And, it, um, you know, until we can work out a way of um, making hydrogen from water uh, with renewable electricity and exporting the hydrogen uh, cheaper than running power lines, then um, we probably ought to run a power line. So I'm hoping Andrew can stay with us for a little while. <laughs> my my girls have baked some beautiful chocolate brownies at the back there. Tea <laughs> coffee's in the in the back room. Please join us. Please chat.
please ask questions amongst yourselves and I'm going to hand over